we're going to zoom into sort of a, a plan view of this to look at why um, the bathymetry or the bathymetry, there we go, um, <laughs> the bathymetry or the underwater topography of this region is important. And that is because, as you can see in this schematic diagram, we have the glacier over here at terminating in this fjord. At the surface, we have polar water, which is, as I said, is relatively cold and light. And then further out and also at depth, we have Atlantic water. And there, there is a particular depth of the interface between these two water masses. And what the, topo the bathymetry, or as I said, underwater topography is doing, um, or rather what exists in this region, uh, has important implications for whether or not this rel relatively warm water can make it to the margin of the glacier and therefore increase the ice melt melting rates. And so as an example of that, we have some o oceanographic measurements from two different, uh, two different fjords in Greenland. Um, on the top, we have Jakobshavn Ice Fjord, and on the bottom is Sermilik Ice Fjord. In both cases, uh, the open ocean is on your left and the glacier is on your right. And what I want you to note in this diagram is here at Jakobshavn, we have this, this relatively high bathymetric sill, and it prevents these really warm waters shown here in red from getting up to the margin of the glacier and therefore influencing the melt rates in these locations. In contrast, in Cernalic Fjord, there is, while there is a little bit of a bathymetric high, it's not very high and it does not prevent these warm waters from getting to the margin of the ice sheet and therefore causes increased melt rates in this region. Despite the importance of understanding the bathymetry of the fjords around Greenland and the implications for the heat transport to the ice and subsequent ice melt and freshwater flux, there are relatively few investigations and locations around the Greenland ice sheet where we have bathymetric or any oceanographic observations, which is not a huge surprise because these environments are hazardous to work in, they're very difficult to access, they're very difficult to get to. They're often covered in ice for a large portion of the year. However, about 200, there are over 200 outlet glaciers draining Greenland. So only having observations for about five of them severely limits our ability to influence, to include these processes in models of Greenland mass loss and ocean circulation. And so the objective of my work is to use remotely sensed observations, in this case of icebergs, to to better constrain the bathymetry of many of these fjords so that we can include this, these parameters in our ocean ice interactions and modeling. Now, it might come as a surprise to you, much as it did to me, that there is not this bathymetric information available. I think we have this conception that we've done a pretty effective job of mapping most of the ocean seafloor. And in the late 1990s, a lot of scientists, researchers, and governments kind of realized that we didn't have this information very well compiled for the Arctic Ocean because it's often covered in ice. And so this interdisciplinary group of people got together and formed the International Bathymetric Chart of the Arctic Ocean, which is currently on its third version. And this is a very important resource. It has allowed a lot of improvements in ocean circulation and modeling, as well as navigation because it identifies features like this large rift system over the center of the Arctic Ocean. However, if we zoom in a little bit further to look at a particular fjord, we can see that the accuracy of this for modeling the heat transport to particular glaciers is much more limited. And so this is a glacier in West, uh, or a bay and uh, fjord in West Greenland called Jakobshavn. And what I want you to note is here on the bottom, we see this uh, IBCAO grid that I just mentioned. And it looks like there's relatively, there's, there's a lot of data coverage of this area. It's a relatively uniform depth. However, if we look more carefully at a local survey that was done, we can see that there's, in fact, a pretty large sill here that is causing, that is keeping some of those warm ocean waters from accessing the ice. In addition, we can see that this fjord is actually very over deepened, which has important implications for the water depth and therefore whether or not the ice in that location can come afloat. And so I, I hope hopefully this demonstrates pretty clearly that we do need more information and that even where we think there might be some information and it's presented in this IBCAO grid, it doesn't actually exist at that level of quality for what we would need for some of the processes we're trying to model. And so what my work does is 
uses stranded icebergs because, uh, as we know, most of an iceberg is below the surface of the water. So we can imagine that if an iceberg is floating along and it comes to a relative bathymetric high, it is going to get stuck on that, on that bathymetric feature. And so, um, and so we look for, by looking for locations where icebergs have become stranded, we can then determine uh, locations where there are relative bathymetric highs in the bathymetry of a given fjord. And so here you can see an iceberg that I've outlined in blue. Unfortunately, because of the lighting, I think it's a little bit difficult to see, but it's right there. It's right there. And these two images, and this particular iceberg was stuck in approximately the same location for the entire summer, um, as long as I could find imagery that you could see through the clouds. Um, and so from here, once we've identified our stranded iceberg, we can go ahead and construct a digital elevation model from near simultaneous high resolution images, which is basically uh, the same satellite takes, a takes two images at approximately a minute apart, and they're looking at the same region from two different angles. And so we can mathematically derive a 3D interpretation of what that surface looks like. That allows us to, um, that allows us to come up with the approximate height of the iceberg that is above the surface of the ocean. From that, that, we can mathematically derive the iceberg draft, or the amount of iceberg that's below the surface. That gives us a maximum water depth for that particular region. And so just as an example of this, um, this is that iceberg that I outlined earlier. Um, this is the digital elevation model of it. So what this is showing is the number of meters above sea level that each pixel is. And so if we approximate this iceberg as roughly 30 meters above sea level. And then we can go ahead and derive mathematically using the relationship between the density of the ice and the density of the ocean water, we can go ahead and estimate that the water depth in this region is about 200 to 270 meters. And if we compare this with the bathymetry maps that have been done, um, created from ship surveys in this region, we see that this is approximately correct. And so what this shows is that this is a viable method of of assessing relative bathymetry and approximate water depths in some of these locations where we don't actually have any measurements. But it, it, uh, it allows us to get this information without having to conduct really expensive, potentially hazardous surveys on the, on the ground. And with this information, we can improve our estimates of freshwater flux um, from the Greenland ice sheet, rates of mass loss from the Greenland ice sheet, and the influence on the ocean and therefore uh, ultimately sea level rise. And with that, I would like to thank my uh, committee, friends, family, department, uh, as well as my funding sources. Thank you, Jeff. We have a couple minutes for questions. Does anyone have any questions? How, uh, how directly did you have to play with the resolution of the satellite images for constraining the uh, errors on your DEF? Vertically or horizontally? Hmm, well, which is most important? Um, in this case, uh, the vertical errors are going to be most important uh, because we're looking at the height. It doesn't I mean, if you think about the size of the iceberg and we're taking an average height above the water surface. However, um, as you may or may not have noticed in the slide where I was showing conceptually what happened, I actually had several different iceberg drafts drawn on there because we don't actually know what the underside of icebergs looks like and where exactly we can only approximate where the center of mass is. And so the Vertical errors in the DEMs are kind of kind of come out in the wash when you account for the fact that we can't we can't say with certainty what the depth of that iceberg draft is. If so that, that makes that sense. Is, yeah, that uncertainty is basically bigger than what you'd expect from the air from the DEM. Correct. Jessica, what is the resolution of the worldview imagery that you used, and is that a, a minimum resolution the, required for this? The worldview imagery for um, constructing the DEMs um, has a resolution around one meter, which gives our DEMs a resolution around two meters. Thank you, Jeff.
So next up, we have Sam Belknaps the third, uh, talking about spatial characterization of names, lobster, fishery, and the change in climate. I'm going to forego the microphone because it's too much of a distraction when it quits out. Hopefully, I can be loud enough. Um, well, thank you all. My name is Sam Belknap. I'm a PhD student in anthropology and environmental policy. And I'm happy to talk today about an applied project in which I've been involved this year um, about bringing together uh, ocean planning, climate change, and Maine's lobster fishery. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the concept of ocean planning, um, it's an idea that's been around for a while, in particular on the West Coast. Uh, but more recently, it's been codified with President Obama's executive order, order of 2010, establishing the National Ocean Policy, which is a wide-ranging policy dealing with many issues uh, for the ocean and the Great Lakes, including ocean, uh, water health, water quality, climate change, and um, natural resource extraction. And what this policy did is it included marine spatial planning as a component of this. And if you see, it broke down the country into nine different locations. Uh, and all of these regions, as they're called in the policy, are charged with creating their own plan for how to use the ocean. And uh, in a general sense, marine spatial planning can be defined as a multi-stakeholder process aimed at ensuring the sustainable use of the ocean now and into the future. And just to give you an idea, our region, the northeastern region, is overseen by NROC, the Northeast Region Ocean Council. And they are charged with establishing our regional ocean plan. And just to give you an idea of the complexities that they're facing, this is a map showing some, not all, of the, use, the ocean uses that are involved in the northeast region, um, including uh, government, natural resource extraction, um, proposed wind sites, and things like that. And, Right now, NROC draws really heavily on GIS maps on where people are using the ocean for what purposes. And to give you an idea of some of these purposes, we have on the left here a map of shipping lanes for the northeastern region. And on the right, we have a map of the multi-species ground fish fishery. And all of these maps rely heavily on either vessel monitoring reports or uh, vessel monitoring systems or vessel trip reports. Uh, which rely on GIS transponders on fishing vessels to create these maps that show where people are when on the ocean. Now, if we look at NROC's catalog for uh, commercial fisheries, we notice that one species in particular is glaringly missing. That's the second most valuable fishery in the Northeast and in the country, and that's the Maine lobster fishery. Um, and the reason that this is lacking is because years ago, the Maine Lobstermen's Association fought hard but tooth and nail to make sure that they didn't have to have vessel monitoring systems on their lobster boats. And as a result, we have no maps. We have no way to visualize where fishermen are using the water. So the question remains, how do we characterize a fishery for NROC without these maps? Um, and this past fall, the Island Institute contacted myself and the former, Department of, the former commissioner of the Department of the Marine Resources and asked us, come up with a way for us to characterize this fishery to, so we can provide some information to NROC. And we realized that the overarching theme with which we're going to need to proceed is one of environmental and climate change, because that's one of the most pressing issues facing the Gulf of Maine right now. And this little video that's going to be looping here gives you an idea about how environmental change can play a role in this, because this shows the changing distribution of lobster abundance over the last 50 years. And because things are changing so quickly and on such a profound scale, we realize that it's important to identify the places where marine spatial planning interfaces with the lobster fishery. And we need to characterize the fishery in a way that could be informative to NROC, and we chose to use anecdotal fishermen interviews, because we don't have this visual data to rely on. And again, one of the primary things we wanted to do is highlight and document the changes that the fishery has experienced over the last 30 years, because there's one thing that the ocean planning world is not good at, and that's dealing with change. And we need to find a way to incorporate change into the ocean planning process. So over the fall and the winter, uh, we did roughly 24 in-depth interviews with fishermen from across the coast of Maine, uh, uh, at least two or three from each of Maine's seven lobstering zones to incorporate the spatial diversity of the fishery. And we also did two focus groups, one early on to help us kind of narrow down what topics we wanted to address, and then one later on to present our initial findings back to the fishermen to see if we were accurately classifying things in a way that they felt portrayed the fishery appropriately. 
And some of our initial results fall into three main categories. Uh, the first category is fishermen are very concerned about how other ocean uses are going to affect their flexibility. Fishermen need to be flexible because they deal with environmental change on a daily basis, and not just short-term environmental change, but some of the longer-term climate impacts that the Gulf of Maine is facing necessitate flexibility on the part of a fisherman. And tied in with this is di this concept of displacement with other ocean uses, potentially constraining fishing effort in a, in a location. Fishermen are, gonna, are going to get displaced. And in the main lobster fishery, if you go and fish somewhere where you are not supposed to fish, bad things happen. If you set your traps there, they will most likely not be there when you get back. So displacement is a major concern for the fishermen. And probably the most important change that came to uh, our attention was this idea of the spatial expansion of the fishery. And this map here is an estimated sediment grain size map that shows the different bottom types. And the darker colors are the ones that we need to pay attention to because that represents the mud bottom. Now, traditionally, mud bottom has been a very unproductive uh, location for the lobster fishery. But over the last five years, it has transitioned to the most productive lobster fishing area, especially in zones offshore that may potentially conflict with uh, offshore wind, offshore aquaculture, and other ocean uses. So this idea that things are changing spatially is really important to inform the plan that what you see now may not be what you see in the future. And again, we're in some of the final stages of wrapping things up, but some of our initial recommendations that we're hoping to make to NROC as a result of this process include the idea that change needs to be incorporated into this process. We need to have an iterative planning process that can revisit issues after a certain number of years to take into account social changes, environmental changes, whether they be part of a natural cycle or longer term climate change impacts. And tied in with this, the plan needs to ensure the flexibility of fishermen is maintained. Because as I mentioned earlier, flexibility is the key for fishing livelihoods. And one of the most encouraging things that we hope to pass on is something that has come from the fishermen, that they recognize the need to incorporate different ocean uses to help mitigate the impacts of climate change and help to adapt to some of those impacts as well. They recognize the need for cleaner alternative sources of energy. But they encourage the, the process to involve stakeholders and involve fishermen to a degree that it has not occurred before to avoid some issues. And I put up this background slide here to kind of highlight this point. This is a proposed wind site off the coast of Long Island and uh, New Jersey. And it's overlaying on, right here in the red circle, it's overlaying on the uh, scallop fishery, fishing map available through NROC. And the scallop fishery is the most lucrative fishery in the country. And this is just one level that shows conflicting use between the wind farm and the, both the fishing lanes and the transit lanes. It's right smack in the middle of uh, shipping lanes as well. It also conflicts with a, an area of uh, other commercial fisheries and sports fisheries. And because we don't have an established ocean, ocean plan by which people proposing projects can engage stakeholders, they run into a whole bunch of issues. They're now tied up in court. Um, and hopefully lessons learned here can inform the ocean planning process and kind of institute some of these uh, stakeholder driven and informed decision making moving forward because the process is set up to be that but it's yet to reach that capacity. So with that, take any questions. Yes. Sam, why did the lobster decide they like mud bottoms? <laughs> There's a whole bunch of hypotheses about that. Um, one is the fact that we've removed lots of the major predators, ground fish, from the Gulf of Maine, so lobsters are just more abundant everywhere. And that's kind of proven true all along the coast of Maine. Uh, the one thing that's a little bit deceiving is that map of changing lobster distributions. It's not, it, it portrays lobsters as marching north, but that's really not what's happening. It's really the density of lobsters that's increasing up and down the coast. We haven't seen a decline other than the southern New England fishery off in Long Island Sound. We haven't seen a decline in other fisheries. It's just the Gulf of Maine has become so much more abundant. And one hypothesis is, is now the lobsters have the ability to spread into these areas where they haven't before. And because we've lost the shrimp, uh, the shrimp fishery, that a lot of dragging would occur on this mud bottom for shrimp. And now that that dragging is not occurring, lobsters are able to make use of that habitat. So, so 
Is that not occurring because the shrimp have gone away? Or yeah, they've had a close season for the last three years because okay. of, of the warming in the Gulf of Maine, driving the, what believed to be driving the food for the shrimp uh, farther north and out of the Gulf of Maine. Not there. <laughs> I know, it's not. They're delicious. <laughs> yes, Jim. Uh, Sam, why did they fight tooth and nail to keep the monitoring systems off their boats? Do they regret that now? They absolutely regret it now because they don't have an ability to say, look at how we use the ocean. The projects that you're proposing will impact us in the various ways. Right now, it's just their, their word against uh, these other ocean uses. Um, and it has to do a lot with kind of the individualistic pioneer nature of the fishery. Um, they're very protective, even though you can see where their buoys are on the water. They're very protective about where they fish and when. And they didn't want anyone to have access to that information for whatever purposes. And, and now having conversations with some of the fishermen, they're really regretting it because they don't have a way to, to show their impact on the ocean. So you think this is perhaps a, a, a lesson learned for them? Kind of I, I, operating. I'm, I'm hoping so. Yeah. And there are lots of, um, if I had longer, I could talk about another project that's trying to create some of these vessel monitoring systems where the data is under the control of the fishermen themselves and can only be used explicitly with their permission for purposes that they uh, determine, but that's a, a talk for another time. <clears throat> Thank you all. Thank you, Sam. Uh, next up is Jamie Heberkamp. Uh, her talk is entitled um, Enhancing Resilience, Adapting, and Wrapping Glacier Treatment. If, if you use the mic, keep it at a, the same distance and close to your mouth, don't? You think that'll work? That should work. Keep it right there. Because I'm not as loud as Sam. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jamie Haberkamp. I'm a PhD student in the Anthropology and Environmental Policy Program, and I'm also part of the IGER um, h Fellowship uh, Cohort 3. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about my dissertation research. Is that the mic doing it? It's yeah. the mic. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I think it's like a low battery. Just speak Just up. Better. Okay. Just sit it down and yell. So yeah. I'm going to talk about my dissertation research, which is um, <clears throat> focused on the political process of adaptation of climate change. Specifically, this research project um, takes place in the Peruvian Highlands looking closely at dimensions of equity and effectiveness and climate resilient uh, policies. So Peruvian high, uh, Peruvians are considered to be among some of the most vulnerable people in the world to climate change impacts on the hydraulic system. And this is due to their a growing um, demand upon a rapidly diminishing water supply um, and also the uneven distribution of water resources across the country. The Andes are home to over 40% of the world's glaciers, and 70% of Peruvians depend upon glaciers to meet their water needs. Um, <clears throat> however, the, due to climate change impacts, the Peruvian water towers are disappearing at unprecedented rates, actually twice as fast as the global average. And um, <clears throat> glacier coverage has actually declined more than 30% since the 1970s. And according to regional climate models, um, they're expected to completely disappear as early as mid-century. So as a result of these climate impacts, water quality and water quantity are diminishing, um, threatening industry, rural livelihoods, and urban ways of life. Um, <clears throat> so the relationship between water uh, quantity and the retreating glaciers is pretty direct, but it's a little more indirect water quality. Um, here, as the glaciers retreat, there's a greater exposure of bedrock, which is resulting in heavier loading of heavy minerals into the um, water stream, which is rendering potable water sources no longer suitable for uh, human and animal consumption. <clears throat> so this is a map of uh, the Santa Rio watershed, which is where my research is situated. Uh, it's also at the forefront of some of these climate change impacts. Um, so I'm looking across, as I mentioned, it's a multi-sided, or I think I didn't mention, but it's a multi-sided study. And I'm looking across um, Yucca Valley and Coquihuanca Valley outside of Juarez. Um, and these are, these two valleys, 
Ours is a pretty large urban center here. And then these two valleys are actually within the jurisdiction of Waskaron National Park, which is um, shown here in yellow. The blue are the glaciers. <coughs> Okay, so what does adaptation look like in the highlands? <laughs> um, currently planned adaptation is pretty top-down. It's concerned with state and international actors um, that are working to develop what's known as ecosystem-based adaptation. <clears throat> and this project would manage water quality climate risks and also enhance resilience across the highlands. The idea is to leverage the ecosystem services of alpine wetlands to help societies adapt to the degrading water, day, uh, water quality <clears throat> issues. So as wetlands offer their unique functions of water storage and water filtration, they can help to uptake some of these heavy minerals out of the water, <clears throat> helping to purify it for downstream users. Um, additionally, wetlands are desired for their ability to capture and store carbon, which is rendering the alpine lands highly desirable. Um, carbon sink for both the state and the world. Um, <clears throat> so in this way, ecosystem-based adaptation can offer triple wins or claims to offer triple wins by reducing uh, community vulnerability uh, through improving water, uh, water quality. And also uh, by enhancing and restoring wetlands to a sustainably, a sustainably managed state and as a carbon mitigate, you know, reaching or <laughs> striving for carbon mitigation goals, um, using it as a carbon sink. But despite the benevolent outcomes of policy, <clears throat> there are some trade-offs. And the point of contention is largely that to enhance alpine wetlands and restore them to some optimal state of functioning, um, the state argues that traditional pastoralist activities need to cease. Um, in some places, maybe just be restricted, but, it, but in some places, be relocated altogether. Um, <clears throat> So if enacted, this policy would affect over 32 Campesino communities that currently access the Alpine Highlands uh, Valleys within Ross Ground National Park and who have been accessing the Highland Valleys for over the last 12,000 years. Um, so at this point, I just want to give a quick socioeconomic uh, context and some uh, situate the Campesinos within their legal frameworks. Um, Highland Campesinos have been granted legal rights of self-government by the crew constitution, uh, post-colonial rule. They're thus given the legal rights to continue the use and self-management of their traditional natural resources and landscapes. Um, and Wasgrove National Park claims to uh, recognize these rights, but since its establishment in the 1970s, has also worked to restrict agro-pastoralist activities throughout this, um, the park's boundaries and buffer zone. Um, this, this Oh, since the 1970s, this has created decades of territorial disputes between the state and campesino communities. As I've mentioned, the 32 villages with, that are targeted for this policy, um, over 50% of the population is in poverty or extreme poverty, and this is based on a uh, monetary valuation. And many of their livelihoods still depend upon traditional systems of reciprocity and subsistence activity. Um, the average household possesses 4.1 head of cattle and seven sheep, which support their subsistence way of life and also bring in meat farmings. Uh, meat sales bring in over half a year's wages for over half of the rural population. So removal of pastoralists from the highlands not only breaches their legal rights, but it also um, has profound effects on their livelihoods. So my research investigates several questions, and today I'm just going to talk about the third one, which is what are the effects of the state's ecosystem-based adaptation project on community resilience, and how are resilience outcomes socially differentiated? The, this question aims to evaluate resilience outcomes of the ecosystem of the EBA policy, <clears throat> and to do that, um, I'm hoping to operationalize an indicator-based framework designed by Engel and others in 2014. Um, and I'm doing this by taking a participatory-based approach, um, which I'll begin doing this summer. Um, <clears throat> the idea is to use um, interviews, focus groups, observation methods. Um, transect walks, um, kind of a whole host of uh, qualitative 
um, tools to start co-producing resilience indicators um, and the assessment tool itself. Um, <clears throat> so in this, um, um, I get, so, sorry, I can unpack the framework just a little bit, but um, maybe later for questions if there are any. Um, so the idea is the framework lay, lays out a real flexible and iterative process of engaging through multiple rounds of um, community-based engagement and producing, co-producing some of the indicators that are really meaningful um, to the local socio-ecological uh, uh, context, but basically looking for place-based indicators um, rather than looking at things that are more generalized or expert knowledge from um, the literature. Um, <clears throat> and so um, the indicators will then serve to inform uh, a questionnaire assessment tool which I'll deploy a year later um, across the two valleys, uh, Kilkiwanka and um, Yucca. And the, uh, I'm doing this through using a natural experiment design, um, looking at one community in Yucca who has already had restricted access to their traditional pastoral uh, lands, pastoral lands, and then another community in Kilkiwanka who still um, continues this traditional way of livelihood. Um, the idea is to, um, through a comparative analysis of this, you start to gain insights as to what the outcomes and resilience are that the um, adaptation policy has. And that's it. So, thanks. Um, what, what kind of uh, community engagement procedures were you going to be thinking of using to um, elucidate these indicators and uh, uh, outcomes? So, um, well, through observation methods, going throughout kind of like day in the life scenarios with uh, some of the pastoralists and really engaging with them in how they use the wetlands and looking for the connectivity between the pastoralists and the wetlands, um, feedbacks. Um, dependencies, um, but then also just through interview methods, um, some oral history work, um, and then the focus groups um, to pull together. Focus groups will come later um, after I've identified some people in the community that might be willing to share insights into what they think. But I think it's going to be really difficult um, because I can't just ask them what makes you resilient. I'm not sure that would mean a whole lot to them. So I think that the challenging part is reconciling the discourse. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we're going to push through the microphone issue. Hopefully they'll resolve themselves. The next step is Lynn. Um, she's going to talk about Crevasse extent and lateral shearing of the McMurdo shear zone in Antarctica using GPR and GPS observations and numerical modeling practices. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, so um, my work uh, is um, involves studying the Ross Ice Shelf, which is the largest uh, ice shelf in Antarctica. And so in particular, I am interested uh, in the western uh, lateral margin, so this area right here. And this is called the McMurdo Shear Zone. And so I just want everyone to orient it, uh, orientate themselves. Um, north is actually at the bottom of the page, because the South Pole is way off the page at the top, so that's um, going to be our reference frame for the rest of the talk. And so what causes this shear zone? So as I smooths, um, around Mina Bluff, it's moving quite fast along the Ross Ice Shelf, but all of the ice behind this outcrop right here is moving a lot slower on the McMurdo side. And so when faster moving ice comes in contact with slower moving ice, it, it shears and pulls apart, creates this massive shear zone right here. And so there are many reasons that we want to study this. One is for logistical reasons. The United States Antarctic Program uh, traverses all the way from McMurdo to the South Pole, and they do this every year. And so the shear zone is a heavily crevassed region, um, and all of the crevasses are covered with snow bridges. 
So if you look at the surface, it's completely flat, and you don't know that there are crevasses under you. And there's a wonderful anecdote of uh, why this area is um, dangerous, and uh, I don't have enough time to talk to you about it today, but the main players are uh, a tractor, a crevasse, and 30,000 pounds of dynamite. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but the moral story is that it's a dangerous area and it needs to be studied. And uh, what we hope to do is um, determine whether or not this is going to be uh, a viable place to cross in the future for the United States Antarctic program. But more importantly, for scientific, scientific reasons, why is this um, an important area to study? Well, so the, the shear zone provides a tremendous amount of stress along the Ross Ice Shelf's western boundary. So it's providing friction along the side it's holding some of the ice back. And so if this area is weakening or has become unstable in the last decade, it's becoming more heavily crevassed, then um, these um, stresses could be transmitted throughout the rest uh, of the ice shelf. And this could um, mean uh, implications for Ross ice shelf stability and future um, implications on sea level rise. So the way we go about studying this area is a three-tiered approach of GPS observations where we derive surface velocities and strain rates. Um, then we do ground penetrating radar observations where we penetrate into the ice shelf to observe crevasse spacing and orientation. And then our hopes are to incorporate these observations into a finite element and numerical model um, where we model the rice ice shelf and in particular how sensitive it is to changing lateral stresses. So we'll begin with our GPS observations. So, so far we've been on two field expeditions and we surveyed, surveyed 29 survey poles. Um, and we've covered a 12 by 12 kilometer grid right here. And so I've been able to um, extrapolate a velocity contour plot that illustrates the um, velocity changes from around 450 meters on the Ross ice shelf side to around 180 meters on the McMurdo ice shelf side. And so where these lines, these contour lines are closely um, most closely spaced, that's where we would imagine the highest strain rate. And so when we, when we extrapolate for the strain rate, that is what we see. Um, and we find that the strain rate peaks at about 0 0.016. And uh, we'll, we'll return to this in just a moment. But moving on to our GPR observations, where our overall goal is to observe what's going on in the ice shelf itself, um, we utilize a uh, robotic, uh, robotically towed GPR antenna. Um, that goes back and forth across the shear zone to take measurements. And we've uh, acquired two massive data sets um, for this area, and we've surveyed a smaller portion of the shear zone, about 5 by 5.7 kilometers. And so our first data set is at a very high frequency, 400 megahertz, and this is really good at penetrating within the top 30 meters. So this is just a portion of one of our transects. And wherever we see these parabolas is where we, um, we can interpret there to be crevasses. Um, and so our next data set is uh, a little bit lower frequency, so it's able to penetrate deeper into the ice shelf, um, all the way to around 180 meters. And with, with this data set, we've picked up a, um, a really um, sharp reflection around 160 meters. And we interpret, interpret that to be the change between inglacial ice and basal marine ice, so ice that's being frozen on underneath the ice shelf. Um, and whenever we see this, these parabolas, again, this is just showing 30 meters, um, at de um, 30 meters from the bottom of where we can see. And we see these parabolas indicative of basal crevassing. So if we look at a full transect, so a complete 5.7 kilometers across and a full 180 meters in depth, and we uh, put it all on one screen, we can kind of get a general idea of what's going on. So I've highlighted the areas where um, it's crevassing in the, the top as well as the bottom. And so we've, we've found crevassing in the top and the bottom uh, within areas of highest strain rate. And so that's not, um, that's not uh, a surprise for the surface crevasses because we had already anticipated that they were caused by the shearing. But a lot of um, less is known about basal, basal crevasses in general. And so our data set is kind of indicating that in this area, they're most likely caused by shearing as well. Um, so, to, so to take that one step further, I've taken five different transects along the right, each kilometer um, um, apart from each other, and plotted them on my strain rate grid to kind of connect with what's going on at the surface with what's going at depth. And so the, the dotted line is the full transect, and the green are the areas of high um, crevassing um, that I've visually picked out. 
And so from this, I've been able to visually um, surmise that capacity initiation occurs at around a uh, strain rate of 0 0.01. And this agrees well with published um, estimates. Um, however, uh, what I hope to do in the future is have an automated approach um, to this and um, complete it on, on many more transects, so it's going to be higher resolution. So finally, we're going to move on to our finite element um, numerical modeling, where we hope to model the Ross ice shelf and uh, perform sensitivity analysis um, with changes in lateral stresses within the McMurdo shear zone. So all of my work in this area is preliminary. Um, I've been um, exploring ways to model the Ross ice shelf and ways that I can hope to incorporate all of the, the physics and have a good base model um, that I can perform sensitive, sensitivity analysis on. And so um, I've chosen the ice sheet system model out of Caltech, ISSM, which is a very robust model and widely used. And so far I've applied a shallow shelf approximation to solve for the surface velocities um, seen on the left. So this is the model velocities. And so the shallow shelf approximation assumes a depth average velocity. So it's assuming there is no friction underneath the ice shelf, which is a good approximation for a large portion of the ice shelf. But so the observed velocity is on the right, and um, the next slide is going to show us uh, the, the places where my model does pretty poorly. And so this is the difference between the model and observed velocities. And so the two places that it does poorly actually come as no surprise. So the first is at the grounding line. Um, so right as the ice shelf becomes afloat, um, it is not a good approximation to um, do a depth average velocity. So I'll need to work on this area. And the second is at the ice shelf front where um, calving is a big issue. So my future work, um, I hope to apply a full Stokes model at the grounding line, so one that in incorporates all of the physics and doesn't um, make those uh, simplifying assumptions. And then I hope to apply a ro ro more robust calving law at the glacier terminus, perhaps one that incorporates crevasse uh, depth into a calving initiative. And finally, to refine the velocity with my GPS observations, which are higher resolution. Um, all right, and with that, I'll take questions. Yeah, the slope along the shear zone constant, or is there episodic at like 40 to 67? Um, it, it's, it's constant, yes. Um, I'm trying to determine whether or not it's kind of um, certain areas are localized where they, uh, they compress and stretch, um, but for the main part, it's constant. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, so I have a question. Any other questions? Are any of these crevasses visible uh, during times of the year at, at the surface? Are they all below? Um, they are all below. Um, and some are just below, so a meter below. And we actually popped one um, this past year crossing the shear zone um, about this wide. Um, so do you wear like a safety harness hooked to something heavy when yes. you do this? <laughs> yes, so, um, so for the GPS observations in the really, really scary areas, we are uh, belayed from the helicopter, so it lands and we're always attached. And then when we cross the shear zone, when we do the rest on the skidoo, um, we, we cross the road. And so every year they fill in crevasses along the road so that it's safe for them to traverse. So we only cross in the, the safe place. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I can't wait to hear about the dynamite story later. Yeah. Um, okay, next up we have Mark Royer, who will be um, talking. His slide, or sorry, his presentation is entitled "The P301 Web API." Thank you. Hi, my name is Mark Royer. I'm a computer science student. Um, I'm a PhD student in computer science. I'm going to talk about the P301 Web API, which is an essentially an interface that um, allows program 
programmers to connect to P301 data through the internet. Um, the, work is, the work is done with uh, my advisor, Cha Andre and Paul, and you can see the schools there here at the university. Um, those of you who may not know it, but the P301 system is a re data repository uh, that allows uh, climate change data to be accessible throughout um, the Climate Change Institute. It allows you to resample data in near real time, and it allows you to visualize data using charts. And finally, uh, the data can be manipulated using uh, some scripting ability that the system has. So the next question is, why do we need to develop a web API? So the reason we developed a P301 web API was to make it so that with data sets that are already inside of P301, and there are approximately 800 um, curated data sets, be more easily accessible to the public. And of course, the internet is available everywhere, so that makes sense. And then finally, uh, we wanted to make it easy for um, developers to be able to programmatically access the data. And so we used, a rest, we used a RESTful interface. So what is REST? Uh, it stands for represent, Representational State Transfer. And what is that? Uh, it's basically a software, a software architectural style that allows a server to be stateless, but encode the state of the um, the system uh, inside inside of the web address or URL that the system is using. And uh, so, think of uh, your standard uh, internet, uh, HTML, websites, protocols like that, and it's cacheable. And so what am I talking about here? I'm just talking about the internet. For instance, everyone's favorite site, Google. Uh, it uses a, a RESTful API to allow you to um, search the internet that is crawled, it's crawled with its robots. Um, so the other thing is, is that when you're dealing with uh, serving to the internet, you want to use the two most common formats for data. Those two common formats are XML, uh, which is typically used for uh, presenting things that are visual. Um, maybe you're uh, giving back an HTML page, which is a visual representative representation of uh, some data. Or you're giving back uh, JSON, which is a JavaScript notation. And uh, you typically use that if the data that's going to be received by the client interface is going to be manipulated uh, with some code, usually JavaScript. Um, so for the P301 API, uh, queries are based uh, using the URL, that's the web address. Results are returned using XML and JSON, which is what we just talked about on the previous slide. Um, the, SIFT, the system software is written in Java. The P301 system has been written in Java, and this allows us to uh, interoperate with legacy code and the P301 code base. Uh, we use Postgres database because it's an open source database that performs well. And uh, we use a Tomcat web server, which is a Java web server. So here's a diagram that shows how the system works. Clients, we could have uh, one through n clients. Clients represent maybe a desktop uh, PC or a uh, phone or a tablet. They have some query, they sent it to the server. The server processes that query. If the uh, query passes the checks, those queries are passed to the database. Those get processed. Uh, and then the results are converted either into XML or JSON. And those are passed back to the clients for further processing. And so this is kind of the diagram that shows the entire process. So let's talk about what the query format looks like. And you've probably seen this, but maybe never thought about it before. But if you're uh, looking in your browser, um, the URL represents the query, and the first part of the URL is just the, uh, the protocol that we're using, and that's typically hidden by the browser. And this is Chrome, which, is, which hides it. 
The second part is the domain name, and uh, we're serving data at d.icecoredata.org. The third part of the query is the, the path to the data. The most important parts are the um, slash data set and data at the end, which says, give, give me back a specific data set. And the last part, which is after the question mark, is where you can specify query parameters to um, get uh, to specify specifically what type of data and how you want the data returned. Um, so let's look at a couple of examples. Uh, what are the available data sets that are provided by the system? How would we do that? How would we get those? In this case, uh, we just specified uh, slash data sets to the system, and you can see it um, at the very end there. And it will return a list of all the data sets and who uploaded the, them to the system. Example two, how can we get more information about a single data set? Uh, in this case, we say slash data set slash data, and we add a parameter uh, D name, and we specify which data set we want, and then that will return um, in detailed information about the data set, including all sorts of numerical data, unit data, and, um, and uh, latitude, longitude, uh, reference information, et cetera. Uh, what other types of uh, optional query parameters are um, supported? Uh, you can filter on specific columns to get min and max results. You can order the results in different ways. And you can sp select specific columns of the types of data that you might want. And then, um, so this is just serving the data. So why do we serve the data? Well, uh, we want to make it easy for people to be able to create applications based on the data that we already have. Um, some interfaces that I'm uh, currently working on are uh, some browsing interfaces to make it easy to be able to search through the data, some searching interfaces uh, looking for various key terms, and uh, some visualization interfaces, uh, basically plotting interfaces. Uh, some of the future work that uh, needs to be done for the system is to make the API hook into uh, make the API hook into some of the other um, aspects of the P301 system, for instance, the resampling functions, get some data, uh, ask for it to be resampled in a specific way, um, grab some data, export it as a specific type of chart, and also uh, making use of some of the scripting ability of the P301 system. So what is the P301 API? It basically makes it easier for people to programmatically access data that we already have in the P301 system. It allows uh, users to be able to filter the data and the results that you get. And it allows uh, the data to be accessed in a web-friendly way, which means you can get the results in XML or JSON, which can be uh, easily uh, manipulated by the clients. Any questions? Are there any sort of security threats to making it more user friendly from the public? Uh, yeah, there are always always security threats for dealing with computers. You just hope that you're not the one that uh, someone decides to really pick on. But uh, yeah, uh, for dealing with this, because it's publicly served data, in the end, we, we don't have to worry about people accessing it. We want them to be able to get at it. Um, so yeah, so the security threats aren't too major. And we talked about deciphering the mechanisms beyond climate-driven changes <clears throat> and the relative abundances of the diatom cyclotilla. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about one of my chapters from my dissertation. And uh, 
In this chapter, I'm actually looking at the climate driven mechanisms which are actually causing changes in the relative abundance of the datum. To start off with, uh, those of you who don't know what diatoms are, the diatoms are actually a group of photosynthetic algae. They are a very common type of phytoplankton and they are found in both um, freshwater and marine environmental systems. And this group is actually at the base of the food chain. They are primary producers and they are responsible for about 20 to 25% of photosynthesis on the planet and about one fourth of the oxygen that we breathe. So, so this group is pretty much very important to study. And for my project, I'm um, basically interested in looking at um, one of the diatom taxa, it's called cyclotella. And it's a planktonic um, centric diatom and it's again found in both a uh, type of aquatic environments, the freshwater and marine. And um, we have like different types of species in this taxa. So for example, right here you can actually see it's called Sacratella badanica, which is pretty much fairly bigger in size. And then we have Rigiosa and Comensis. And these two species are fairly moderate in size. And then we also have Stilitra, which is a very really smaller size species. So we have like a quite variation in the size and the structures of these species. And the most important thing about um, the diatoms is that they are very really sensitive to changing environmental conditions. So we can actually use them as an indicator of climate change. So um, the reason I'm interested in this project is that um, what's happening is as the climate is changing, we are seeing a widespread changes in the abundance of this diatom taxa across different lakes in the Arctic since 1850. And these changes are appearing to be driven by climate change, but we still don't know the actual mechanisms behind those, and we are just beginning to understand what are the mechanisms which are causing these changes across the Arctic landscape. So this figure here is from small little um, 2005, um, and in this study, they actually um, the figure here actually represents the data profiles from different lakes in the Arctic, and it also shows the timing when these changes were occurring in the lakes. So it's hard to see in the figure here, but when we zoom into it, so you can actually see right here is the cyclical species. So you can actually see over the time since 1850, there's a a gradual increase in the abundance of this taxa in this lake. Similarly, if we go to another lake, you can actually see again there's an increase in the taxa. And same for the other two lakes. So in bottom here, you can see an increase and again an increase. But um, there are a couple of different mechanisms that have been suggested which are actually driving these changes. So one of the mechanism is the direct effect of the temperature. So uh, in this paper, in, in Rulan et al, which came in 2015, and um, in this study, what they actually suggest is that as the temperature is increasing, you will see an increase in the abundance of this taxa. So right here in this figure, they kind of correlate and suggest there's a positive relationship between. So as the temperature is increasing, you will see an increase in the abundance of this taxa. Or another way to look at is through the ice out days. So imagine when the temperature is increasing in the lake, um, the ice on the lake will go much more early. So the ice in the lake is going much more early compared to the previous days. And you will see an increase in the abundance of this taxa again. But this is not what is happening all over the place. So, so this figure here is from Lobster Lake, which is here in Maine. And in this study, they actually found that pattern between the lake ice out days and the increases in the abundance of that taxa. 
So this kind of raises the questions like what is the actual mechanism behind the changes which has been occurring to our different lakes in the landscape. So, um, so we think it's not actually the direct effect, but it's kind of like an indirect effect for temperature. So what's happening is as the temperature is increasing, it's kind of changing the light and the nutrient availability in the lakes. So we think it's kind of more like the indirect effect of the temperature. And I wanted to test uh, this relationship or this mechanism for my research project. So my research question uh, is like, how does the interactive effect of the temperature, light, and the nutrients kind of affect these the abundance of this taxa in the lakes in the Arctic? So my research site is here in the southwest of the Greenland, and I have two source lakes, 903 and SS32. So these two lakes um, are also <coughs> different in the type of the community structure they have. So 32 here is a diatom dominated lake, whereas 903 is a lake that is kind of dominated by other type of phytoplankton groups. So we have like quite a variability in the community structure in the lakes too. And these two lakes also have Stilitra, which is one of the Cyclotilla taxa, uh, which is kind of common <clears throat> in between these two lakes. So which led uh, me to ask a second question which was like how the stilidra, which is a common species between these two lakes, uh, will respond to the tested variables in two different community structures. So, uh, so we collected the water samples from these two lakes, 903 <clears throat> and 32, and then we incubated those samples in 903, which acted as a cold incubating system which is closer because it's close to the ice sheet and has like pretty, um, cooler temperatures, and we also incubate the other samples in SS1 and SS2, which act uh, or which served as a warmer incubating system. Okay. So this is kind of a factorial experimental design that I'm testing. So I have these two different levels of temperature, so low temperature and high temperature. And we also have two different levels of the light, low and high, and the nutrients in which we added the nutrients and one without the nutrients. So my treatment samples will kind of look like, so for example, we'll have low temperature, low light, and then the nutrients. Similarly, we'll have um, low temperature, low light without the nutrients. And again, uh, we'll have low temperature with the high light, with the nutrients added and without the nutrients. And this kind of goes the same for the high temperature. So that's the results I got so far. So I tested uh, this for five different species, but I'm gonna be showing the results only for the two species. So what we found um, the most interesting thing was uh, that we had like a difference in the response of the species and each species responded differently. So first of all, so we have this, the panel over here is the low temperature and here is the high temperature and on the bottom we have low light and the high light. So when we added the nutrients, there was a positive response for both the species. So you can actually see the red bars here are with the nutrients. So when you add the nutrients, you can increase in the abundance of this taxa, which is right <coughs> on the top is the badanidum. So an increase, an increase, increase, increase in um, all the different treatments. And same, a thing happened for the other species, which is Shrediosa. So again, we add the nutrients, there is an increase under all the treatment levels. Uh, but these species are also kind of different um, in the in, uh, they have like a different response to the light treatments. So you can actually see the badanica here was more under the low light. Again here under the low light in both temperatures compared to the high light treatments. But for the Lidhiosa, it kind of had more densities in the high light, uh, high light treatments under both the temperature, low temperature and the high temperature. 
So there is a difference in the response to the light. And for Badanica, we found a significant interaction between the temperature light and the nutrients, whereas for the video, so there was no interaction, but just independent effects of the light and the nutrients. And uh, the, this is the result for my second question where I was looking at the response of Stigodra in two different communities. So again, we had uh, a positive response to the nutrients. So when you supply the nutrients, there's an increase in the texa in the both lakes. The on the top is 32, which is um, diatom dominated lake, and in the 903, which is phytoplankton dominated lake. And for the species, they both of them have a significant interaction of the light, temperature, and the nutrients. And the most interesting thing that we found was that um, here you could actually see in, under the high temperature treatments, the cell densities kind of increased when it was in a diatom dominated lake, but the cell densities kind of decreased right here under the high temperature highlight when it was kind of dominated by the other phytoplankton groups. So you could have to see how the community can play a very important role. So, so we had like a completely different response of the, the species when it was dominated by a diatom lake and where it was um, dominated by other phytoplankton groups. So overall, um, we do found a difference in the response of the species in this taxa. There was no independent effect of the temperature and um, they have interactive effects suggesting the indirect role of temperature, um, which plays in affecting the light and the nutrient availability in the lake. And we also found um, how the community structure can also play a very important role in determining uh, the relative abundance of this taxa in the future. So that's, that's all. <laughs> May have missed it and it's hard to hear you but um i was unclear about your experimental design did you take the diatoms from those lakes back to the laboratory to do these experiments no we uh, took the water samples from the lakes and then we took those samples and incubated within the lake incubated them where yeah, within the lake within the lake within the lake so we had like a lake which has a warmer temperatures which serve as like a high temperature system and we have another lake which has low temperature which serve as a cold incubating system um the slide that you had with the uh, um that had the processes broken up either on or off mm -hmm. did you say that was factorial or exponential factorial. isn't that exponential oh the options, isn't it the leaves and the trees? Yeah. No, I don't think so, because we kind of like divide it. So it's kind of like a complicated to follow through that, but it's like we had like a temperature. We had like a, for example, we had just like a sample, which had like high temperature, high light, and the nutrients. And the same, we had like for the low temperature, low light, and the nutrients. So we're kind of like dividing we have like two levels of each. So two levels of temperature, two levels of light, and two levels of the nutrients. Okay. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, I guess I'll have to talk to okay. you later. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> about preliminary results for the change of northern ice stone from 16 Good afternoon, my name is Marsh Potowski. I'm post MySki graduate student, and today I will present preliminary results from Kilimanjaro Northern Ice Field Expedition, funded by National Geographic and supported by uh, Paul. Uh, for decades, uh, ice core studies have been largely focused in polar regions. Uh, over recent decades, more ice cores have been recovered from high mountains uh, glaciers around the globe. A, la a large data gap still remains in the tropics. Uh, there are existing uh, ice cores from Kilimanjaro, but our ultra high resolution record from Kilimanjaro uh, will fill spatial gap between data recovered from uh, Kilimanjaro and other tropical glaciers. 
Uh, our major research objective for the pilot uh, for this pilot study uh, was to find potential future drilling site, detect meltwater uh, influence at uh, surface and base, map for the first time uh, bedrock topography and ice thickness, um, map for the first time internal stratigraphy uh, with the ice core drilling area, and explore and interpret uh, internal layers to link former ice core drilling and wall sounding sites to understand the significance uh, of basal ice. Um, Kilimanjaro is the highest mountain in Africa. It's off straight to Bukano, right up uh, 5,895 meters above sea level. Uh, it's located in the north uh, east part of Tanzania, close to the uh, border with Kenya. Um, this map shows um, temperature difference between last two uh, decades, 20th century, and two previous ones. And uh, as you can see, there was like big warming in all tropical Africa, especially uh, in southern Sudan, Ethiopia, Angola, uh, Kenya, and uh, Tanzania as well. Um, that's the view on Kilimanjaro from the east side. Um, that photo was made in 2011. And this uh, largest body of ice, that's uh, northern ice field. Um, there is like two small pieces of ice uh, that uh, will remain after um, uh, eastern uh, ice field. And barely you can see here is like southern ice field. Uh, this photograph uh, was taken in uh, 1938. And as you can see, the glaciers, they were doing much better that day. They were much thicker. That's the northern ice field with some extension to the east side, eastern ice field, and then southern ice field. Um, the glaciers of Kilimanjaro are vanishing uh, due to regional warming and more likely uh, linked to global warming. And this uh, yellow-orange line shows uh, the uh, glacier extent in uh, 1962. And the white patches that uh, the glaciers are uh, seen uh, in 2000, January, um, that's the photograph from Landsat. So uh, over these 38 years, uh, Kilimanjaro has lost approximately 55% of its glaciers. Uh, to determine ice thickness, uh, my colleagues uh, from Germany and Switzerland, they use two different uh, radar uh, systems with different sets of antennas. Um, here is illustration of spatial coverage of GPR uh, profiles with uh, 100 uh, megahertz antenna. So that research mo mostly focused on the west and the central part of the northern ice field. And with some uh, results with maximum ice thickness up to 53 meters in central part uh, of the uh, northern ice field. Here is another one illustration of spatial coverage of GPR profile with 200 uh, megahertz antenna. It covers almost all uh, glacier and exactly same result. Central part is up to uh, three, uh, 53 meters ice thickness. That's uh, an example of radargram and some this red line uh, represent one of the uh, internal reflectors that we had seen in the profile. Another one slide from 200 megahertz um, radar. Um, that's the profile with uh, three major um, distinct ref uh, reflectors that can be uh, traced uh, along the entire profile. Um, and on the left side, that's the view on the on the ice cliff. So uh, that reflectors, they we, we can see them in the radar, and also uh, uh, we can see on on the wall. So that's um, that, that reflectors that the um, dust uh, dust layers. During uh, this uh, field campaign, we collect ice samples for uh, laser analysis uh, for carbon fourteen measurements and isotope um, uh, samples uh, for uh, uh, isotopes. Uh, yeah, uh, ice for isotope uh, isotope measure, measurements. My colleague they collect uh, amount of uh, GPR data and we measure. Uh, uh, glacier surface temperature. Um, for ice surface ice sampling, we use um, two uh, inch electromechanical drill. Uh, we were able to drill only 60, 65 uh, centimeters 
uh, because we find out that there, there was like pretty thick uh, dust layer that we can't reveal. We tried a couple of times, but we had to gave up. So we have to give up because after um, 20, 30 minutes, that old borehole that just was filled up by water. So we have to change our strategy. So we went down to the ice cliff and we sample um, uh, ice walls. Uh, we collect samples mm -hmm. on the east side, uh, side close to the camp, and on the west side. The way how we sample the, the ice, we use an electric uh, chainsaw to collect uh, blocks of ice for uh, carbon-14 measurements, uh, laser analysis, and we use also ice crews for um, ice sampling for um, isotope analysis. So here is a, an example, uh, one meter uh, long uh, profile with two centimeter resolution uh, sampled ice that's showing um, Delta O18. So as you can clearly see, the, the record uh, is still well preserved. I'll skip this one. Um, and as I mentioned before, we collect also a couple um, block of ice uh, for laser analysis. Here is an example of uh, four centimeter of ice uh, from um, central part of the glacier. Some uh, chemical species, uh, they show like high variability, like uh, iron. Some of them, they create flat. Um, here is another one example, 22 centimeter uh, piece of ice uh, collected on the west side. So again, I'd like to focus on iron so you can see pretty high variability. So we assume it's a seasonality. Uh, when we focus, just we can see up to four peaks in one centimeter. Um, our uh, major key findings for uh, this um, study its ice thickness uh, within drilling are uh, around 45 meters with maximum ice thickness 53 uh, towards the east in all 200 megahertz shield profiles uh, at least three large reflectors appear basal ice contains a chemical and isotopic record and surface water indicates uh, intense melting and no preserved chemical and isotopic record in upper part of the glacier and i would like to um say that that place is really unique and it's disappearing so it's next couple of years that's the last chance to collect this paleo uh, climate record so we are in kind of rush to collect this um, ice core to keep it for future uh, as an archive and i would like to thank um, all people involved in that project especially porters that they were carrying uh, all, all heavy loads up to the top and assist us all the time and um, I would like to thank uh, National Geographic, Paul, and all people involved in that project. Thank you. Is any of the dust volcanic ash? If not, what is it? Uh, it's volcanic uh, ash, but it's a local. It's not from volcano eruption, so it's um, it's kind kind of questionable, uh, questionable because uh, previous ice cores uh, they indicate also dust layers, but there is no uh, good explanation for that. Why there is uh, accumulation? There must be some couple of events that allow um, accumulate that uh, uh, dust on the surface, and then again snow accumulation over. It. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Okay, next up is Laura Gary. She's going to be talking about testing for biotic feedback in Tidal Marsh Community Stability in the Bay of Steel, Laura. Go for it. Thank you. Okay, I will try to channel uh, Brian Olson and speak really loud so that you guys can hear me. So to start, I'll just introduce salt marshes. They are the transition zone between the upland area and the ocean. And because of their location, they are considered a stressful environment. 
They are very salty. They have different salinity levels. They also have a flooding regime because of the tidal action. And because of this, they are considered a simple system. They have low species diversity because not a lot of species can figure out how to live here. And because of that, we see simple food webs such as just predator, herbivore, and plants. And the thing to know about simple systems is if there's any change in the level, you see pretty drastic changes in the other level. And so this is classic food web theory where if you take the predator out, the herbivores increase in a lot of numbers and can decimate the local plants. And we've seen this in southern marshes where um, we call it runaway herbivory, where essentially the herbivores, have, they do not have that predator pressure. And so their numbers go crazy. Uh, so this is an experimental way where they built an enclosure, kept all the predators out. These are the marsh periwinkle snails. They go crazy, decimate the whole vegetation. And so we don't have these snails in our northeastern marshes. Uh, but there's still a concern that with simple food webs, that if certain things get out of whack, uh, we could maybe see an effect like that they see in the southern marshes. Uh, and this is important when we start talking about sea level rise. And so luckily we know that salt marshes have been able to keep up with sea level rise uh, for a few thousand years. And people like Dan and Joe have soil cores and they can look back in the history of a marsh and see how it's, for it's formed. And um, one way that they have been able to keep up with sea level rise is moving upland. And sorry, the picture's kind of dark, but there's a tree stump in that ditch. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about is how salt marshes can gain an elevation, because this deals back with plants. This is a really complicated uh, process, and I'm going to just explain it very simply. So marshes can gain elevation through vertical accretion, one, by sediment accretion. So as a daily high tide comes in and brings sediment with it, um, and then the plants can help kind of trap that sediment. So when the tide goes out, the sediment just kind of falls down and through the years it builds up. We also have peat accretion, and this is in the Northeast. And that's just basically plant biomass that hasn't decomposed. And through the years it builds up. And so peat and sediment accretion can kind of combined to build up or to gain elevation for the salt marshes. And so again, as long as you, if you have the plant biomass, you have the increased potential of peat accretion and also just that plant there to hope, hopefully trap that sediment. And again, going back to this, you know, and seeing that extreme case in the southeast, it's a concern is, will we see something like this that could lower the plant biomass that could potentially uh -huh. affect a salt marsh ability to keep up with sea level rise. And this is important because we know that the salt marsh sparrow, which is a salt marsh specialist, meaning it's found, it breeds and lives completely in the salt marsh, um, is declining and it's an insectivore. And so here's a graph for one of my old lab mates. Uh, on the bottom it is a year and on the Y it's salt marsh sparrow abundance index. And as you can see, it's declining. And there's some estimates that in 50 years, this bird will go extinct. But before it goes completely extinct, we're going to see in local marshes where um, it will be locally extinct. And so my first question is, will the absence of the sparrow actually cause a trophic cascade? And if yes, does that strength vary across their range? So for the first question, you know, if the sparrow becomes locally extinct, will we see herbivore numbers go up? Will we see that indirectly affect the local plant biomass? And then does the strength of the effect vary across their range? And this is due to, you know, instead of just kind of looking at this at one place and assuming it's consistent throughout the sparrow's range, um, we can see if maybe it varies spatially. And there's some evidence that once you start going to their southern range of the salt marsh sparrow, you see more complexity in the system, meaning that there's a little bit, there's more players in the food web. So when you have an absence of a major predator, it's a kind of absorbed in the food web and there will be a difference, but the strength is not as strong or drastic. Easiest way to test this is basically remove the predator from a system. So I did that with these PVC frames and with the bird netting. And essentially the bird couldn't access that area in the marsh. And so my, my second question, does it vary across the range? Um, I set up eight sites starting in Southern Maine down to New Jersey. I had two summer seasons, 2014-15, 
and I collected plant biomass samples and the exposure and control at the end of the seasons, but also collected invertebrates and conducted bird surveys throughout the season to get temporal change. So for my results, um, you know, is there a trout fit cascade? Will we see removing the birds from the system an indirect effect of decrease in plant biomass? So we saw the opposite effect. And on the X, you see is control and exposure, and you also see these lines. This is one site. So we'll just call this site A. This is site A control biomass, and this is site A exposure biomass. And so this Y is plant biomass. And you can see generally the trend is opposite of what we thought. So to understand if maybe this was due to the birds versus an artifact of the experiment setup, we can look at the bird counts and the change, which is here, the change between control and exposure, and this is absolute, and compare it to what the amount of birds we saw at each site. And so you can see that's a pretty weak relationship. So it's not very clear on this point. But for the second question, does the strength of the effect vary across the range? We have to look at this graph again, because this line that is really going against the other ones is the same point in, my, in this graph, the outlier all the way over there. That is my most southern site. So not only do I see a difference in the um, results with the biomass, where instead of seeing higher exposure like the other sites, we see lower biomass in the exposure. Also, we see this outlier that's really making this trend look bad. And so if I remove that outlier, I see this tighter fit that I would assume that Obviously, as you have more birds in your sites, you see a bigger difference between your control and your experiment. So not only do we have something going on at the most southern site, um, we have this opposite effect. We also have a possibly a strength being less. So in conclusion, you know, was there evidence of trophic cascade? Uh, for my northern sites, you know, I would say there it was, uh, but it was us just not predicting this intermediate predator and we'll just call it a spider this time. And so when you have this intermediate predator, you kind of have it another link in the chain. So when the sparrows were taken out of the system, intermediate predator really increased, hit the herbivores hard, and that resulted in a lot more biomass in our exposures. For the southern sites, um, it gets a little bit more complicated. And this is what I kind of hinted to that as you go south in the marshes and you, this is New Jersey, you get more complexity in the system, so you get more players. Um, there's evidence that spiders will eat each other, so adult spiders will eat juvenile spiders. And so when you take a sparrow out of the system, you again get this other link. So you have more maybe adult spiders, less juvenile spiders, more herbivores, less biomass, but you also see this where it is dampening the effect. So at each level, it's not as extreme as when you have those really simple food webs. So obviously for future steps, understanding the sparrow diet, uh, we have fecal samples and we're gonna use sequencing techniques to really quantify it to see what they're actually eating. And also I have invertebrate samples. I have a lot that I'm still going through picking and identifying. And that will tell, that will tell the true story in the exposure and the control to really see what's driving my results. And with that, I would like to acknowledge everybody, my funding sources and my advisors and questions. I'm not an ecologist, but I'm just wondering when you set the PVC cages, mm -hmm. did you do them all at a certain time of day? Or I'm just wondering about the insect ecology in those spaces in different times of day, and if that might have influenced what was in the cage. Yeah, no, uh, so they were set up for the, we set them up in May, and then they were just up the whole time through the season. And so you do have different insects and um, invertebrates will have peak abundance and that, but they're set up the whole time. So the bird, if they're set up, the bird can't go at all, but the controlled paired plots are just right next to them. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, it, it, uh, and also just what time of day? I mean, were they all set up during the daytime or at a certain time of day? I would assume that certain times of day or night would have more insects in the marsh than others. So setting awesome? up early in May wouldn't really affect Effective. So is there a permit structure for the um, season? And the, the net's not big enough to keep bugs in it for out. They actually completely move. 
So it's more to their natural system. Um, and so when we collect it, I think maybe like, maybe you're asking about collecting during the day. It was always during the day um, and bugs tend to be, it depends, but invertebrates tend to be more active just during the day. Um, but they are permit structures and we set them up before really even a lot of the invertebrates are really out in full force. It's just starting to, you know, they'll just start starting to move and be active. Oh, yes. I'm just curious, life cycle span of the bugs, growth rates, the plants. How many years would you want to do this? And how quickly do you think, if you were actually doing the same sites for several years, that you'd see um, a really uh, better, really stronger correlation? Do you think that matters? Is one season enough? You know, that's the big question when it comes to trophic cascades <coughs> and all the experiments, because a lot of times systems they have a way to work it out after a while. So you do introduce this like extreme change where the sparrow is gone and then everything's out of whack and maybe through a few years, it will maybe figure it out. Um, the problem with our salt marshes is like I said, there's just not a lot of diversity there. And so in a lot of aquatic systems, they have these strong trophic cascades because without another player, like another major predator to replace the sparrow, um, you see the changes last a lot longer. So for something like this, um, you know, it's always better to have long-term data. And I mean, five years would be wonderful to kind of just see. And with our two years, you know, we were hoping to see, and that's more analysis, maybe a year effect. So maybe it'd be more extreme the first year and then the second year not extreme, or maybe the first year is kind of extreme, but then it's doubled the second year because you still have that effect. And those you know, herbivores were doing really well, they laid more eggs, there's more of them, and then the next year, all those eggs, you know, hatch and you have more bugs. And so you really don't know, and I would say five just because of funding, but you know, 20 years, let's just let's go big. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Alexis. I'm a master's student in the Climate Change Institute here on campus. And I'm also the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Penobscot Nation. Um, this project uh, is highly sensitive um, in the Wabanaki communities here in Maine. Um, and it is uh, just slightly controversial. I'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> between the Wabanaki communities and the archaeological world, but it wouldn't be a project of mine if it didn't have some aspects of controversy. <laughs> um, this project came about um, recently uh, due to unforeseen circumstances. One, the replacement of the Reversing Falls Bridge um, in Blue Hill, uh, which will directly affect the Nevin Shelly uh, with the bridge replacement and road widening. Second is the repatriation of the funerary objects um, that occurred last summer from the RSP body. Um, all the funerary burial belongings are now in the possession of uh, <clears throat> the Wabanaki communities. Um, and they are slated for uh, reburial um, at a designated area uh, sometime later this year. And thirdly, um, this was a project I was looking to do after, um, after uh, graduation with uh, Brian Robinson, but due to uh, you know, our good friend and colleagues, uh, health circumstances, I'm expediting this, uh, this project. So again, the Nevin Shell Heap is on what they call Mill Island uh, in Blue Hill Bay. Um, it's a very small, but one of the most significant uh, shell maidens of the uh, Moorhead burial tradition here in, in the Gulf of Maine. Originally excavated, uh, starting in 1936 by uh, Fred Johnson, Doug Byers, and others from the RS Peabody Foundation, that was known at the time, uh, from Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. Uh, and it's at that time where rudimentary techniques were still taking place, but with uh, Byers, he, he used a little more uh, care and technique. So instead of clam rakes and garden hose, uh, <laughs> he actually used shovels and trowels. Um, but with no screening. So it was still uh, 
collecting the large uh, artifacts. So what he originally thought was a long-term habitation site uh, in Blue Hill turned out on one of the last few days of his excavations in the first field season, he stumbled across the Red Oak Burial. Um, and then uh, in the following season, uh, they found that they had 12 graves in total. Um, eight of them were primary burials with nine individuals, nine uh, individual burials. <clears throat> eight individual burials with two bodies in, in one grave eight, um, and four secondary burials with um, 18 individuals total. Um, two of the larger graves, graves five and nine, contain multiple burials uh, within them. So there's a total of 27 individuals, but there are some discrepancies. Um, one burial, grave 10, is uh, not considered a Moorhead burial. They, they, they thought it was a little later due to lack of primarily red ochre and lack of grave goods um, with them. And an individual in grave four, I believe, I'm calling, to where it was a child's burial, but um, Leslie Shaw in 1988 did some analysis of human remains uh, being housed currently at Harvard, noted that there was an older woman um, as well in that. But um, upon further review of the site itself, grade four, which is less than uh, 50 centimeters away, right on the water, was being washed out. And uh, grade eight seemed to have washed into grade four, because uh, grade eight uh, contained a uh, late, older male and a female. So um, I was speculating that a miniaturized version of long shore drift was occurring along the beach. <laughs> So again, Myers, uh, the techniques for excavations weren't great, but his record keeping was excellent for the time. Um, he has tons and tons of notes and these flashcards looking at the complex stratigraphy within this site, uh, which involves both uh, occupation as well as uh, a cemetery site within it. Um, and between his radiocarbon dates and uh, Professor Robinson's Brian states, um, it goes from 240 to uh, 4245 BP. So we're looking at uh, the late, uh, into the late Moorhead burial tradition, up and through uh, into the ceramic period. <clears throat> so again, um, this past summer, we started uh, intense negotiations with Federal Highway Administration and the main DOT for the replacement of the historic bridge over the reversing falls. Um, they're not sure what they want to do with it, um, but the foundations that you can see on the edge of the bridge is deteriorating. You can watch water go right through that stone foundation uh, to change into the tides. <coughs> so we went in um, collaborative effort between Penobscot Nation, uh, Maine Historic Preservation, and the University of Maine um, to mitigate as much as we can to, to prevent further destruction of this site. Um, granted, buyers excavated in the 30s, not all of the human remains were um, collected, so to say. Um, so there are still burials within uh, the midden itself, and myself with other uh, tribal historic preservation officers and community leaders are looking to preserve this site as best we can with no future destruction to, uh, to the site itself. So here they're running along the top of the, where the road's going to be. Um, right at the edge of buyers' uh, backfill areas, and we're pulling out beautiful uh, evidence of swordfish, that's a swordfish bird, as well as uh, stone and bone tools um, up alongside, right on the road, right next to it. So going down last fall um, with Brian Robinson uh, and a host of others that helped out along the way, Greg, Kendra, Andrew, Skye, um, we excavated into the eroded part because right along the waterfront is erosion is heavy. Um, so we wanted to look in to see. One of the things I was interested in is that complex stratigraphy and the abundant, the, this abundant shell, crushed shell, lower shell, fish scale layer. It's um, right now it appears to be all under uh, the burials, but. Um, 
been talking with uh, other people like Art Spies from the state and uh, Nate Hamilton from USM. Um, we're, we're really doing a, a reanalysis of the site as a whole and the strategy. So here's an updated map <clears throat> produced uh, by Andrew Heller here at the university. Um, and it's a culmination of buyer's map, uh, the Maine Historic Preservation Commission's map, as well as uh, the map produced here. So you can see the burials are primarily right along the beach, beach line, and these are the first two discovered here. And then the, the bulk of the big ones are in the back. So basically what I'm doing is a cemetery analysis, which really hasn't been done. I didn't want to impede on Nate Hamilton's work as doing an analysis as the whole site. And I'm looking to reconstruct uh, spatially and temporally the cemetery itself. And, um, and to give our ancestors a voice. We haven't had a voice in any of our cemetery excavations and I'm looking to give uh, the Wabanaki communities a voice with this project. Oh, he's gonna come up there. So basically here, I'm gonna show you some slides highlighting some of the artifacts um, that will, on one hand, sadly, not be analyzed or seen again uh, once I'm done with this research. Um, again, these will all be uh, reburied um, in a ceremony uh, later this year. So a red paint cemetery is not red paint without iron pyrites. Um, well, that was quick. <laughs> um, so we're going to fly right through these. So we have diagnostic and distinct artifacts, a lot of swordfish, and a lot of stone, a lot of plummets, gouges, um, not as many uh, flaked instruments in the uh, cemetery sites itself, but a lot of bone, um, a lot of bone artifacts. Uh, distinct and diagnostic artifacts, ground slate, bone whistle, which is only seen a couple other times in the Gulf of Maine. But the high end faunal, specialized faunal, you have sea mink, orcas, um, and this uh, will be analyzed as mortuary uh, items, why they were used. So the bulk of it, what gathers most interest are these moose daggers. Um, they're incised, and primarily they are found within the graves of children. Um, they're not really in any adult graves, and the bulk of the burials within the cemetery are children um, under the age of uh, 18. So with these, these are it's close up of some of the incised daggers. They're like scrimshaw, uh, what I cons we consider scrimshaw. And um, one another final product of this will be experimental archaeology, where I'm going to be replicating these uh, daggers in uh, using stone and bone tools and what I think to, what was used to do the incisions are uh, modified beaver teeth, um, just because they're in there with them. And uh, these beaver teeth are cut a certain way to, to it looks like they were used, um, along with antler sockets. And the beaver teeth fit perfect inside the sockets, um, as far as holders. So that was real quick. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank all everyone on this screen for helping out. And um, I guess I'll just take any questions or leave it at that. If there's any. <laughs> yes. Chris, you have obviously an awesome responsibility in, in many ways, both uh, to the tribe and to science. Um, what are the cultural uh, traditions, if any, about rescue archaeology? If, if a site is disturbed and reburied somewhere else. Is that a good thing, bad thing, neutral thing? Well, as of right now, it's we try to leave it as we can. Um, one of the during the negotiations, what what I had said to the highway, Federal Highway is, if any human remains are encountered, we're stopping. Um, it'll stop the project for one, not entirely, but it'll stop until we can decide what we're going to do. So what we're looking at now is what I'm pushing for is an intense layer of fill over this site once we're done. Um, Art Spies from the state agrees with it, so we're both coordinating together against Federal Highway. Federal Highway just wants to come in and level all the trees and park the machinery on this site, and it, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. 
Chris, is the age profile for this cemetery different than the other red paint cemeteries that we know about significantly? It's just later. Okay. It's, it's just later. Uh, one cool thing that I've been looking at is um, just weeding with this stratigraphy, different the burials from 1 to 12, there's 12 burials, they're different in ages, but um, the significant ones, according to the dating evidence, seems generational. So we're looking at three generations of burials within. Um, so it'd be like grade one is older than grade five, grade five is older than grade nine. <clears throat> so we're looking at three different generations and you can see it in the tools going through, they're getting more elaborate as, as the dates get older. Uh, younger. If this was a, a burial site, uh, and it was, where was the living site? Right behind it. It appears to be right behind it. <laughs> and it goes in the, up and across the road. So we're on, working on the other side of the road as well. And we're finding a later archaic component, but as, as well as a ceramic period component um, on top of it. And it's, and it's just spread right, right along, um, going back into the, the homestead property, which we didn't bother with, but we're looking right at just the, excuse me, the, the site, the immediate site itself and along the waterfront, because we don't know how many burials have been washed away due to sea level rise since then. Um, there's just no evidence of it. you have an nice. estimate of how much erosion has occurred? <clears throat> A quick estimate. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could discuss it during the break. Yeah, we have one more Sure. Uh, so I'm aware that my talk is what stands between you and our first break, uh, so I'll try and keep it light and uh, brief. Uh, I've been trying to develop a validated long-term satellite-based record for albedo uh, in the Central Alaska Range for a number of years now. Uh, and as I always begin, I'll begin with uh, a background on snow and ice albedo. Uh, we don't all work within the cryosphere, uh, so some of this may be new, uh, but it's uh, um, we have a diagram here. We have uh, on the left ice covered landscape, on the right uh, ice free landscape. And the ice covered landscape includes uh, sea ice, uh, seasonal snow cover, and glacial snow and ice, and all of which reflect about 90% of incoming solar radiation. On the right, we have uh, the ice-free landscape, including soil and vegetation, which reflects about 20% of incoming solar radiation, and uh, open water and ocean water, uh, which reflects only about 10% incoming solar radiation, meaning it absorbs nearly 90% of all incoming solar radiation. Um, and often in the natural environment, we see these two landscapes juxtaposed uh, together. Uh, so any change in aerial extent of the snow and ice could lead uh, to feedback cycles where uh, if the snow and ice retreats uh, slightly, there's more land or ocean that is, is, is exposed um, and more energy could be absorbed, absorbed by the landscape, uh, leading to warming and further retreat. Uh, and we've seen this recently in the Arctic, uh, warming oceans and warming atmospheric temperatures are leading to rapid glacial retreat in the Arctic. And uh, it's largely due to uh, these differences in albedo. Uh, and since albedo is a primary control on the energy budget, the global energy budget, uh, these ramifications, ramifications are quite serious. So I've been working to uh, quantify albedo in mountainous terrain, um, and in particularly in Alaska, uh, with the goal of increasing our understanding of um, mountain glacier response to climate, this climate forcing uh, and how that um, could play into the mass balance of glaciers. Uh, so I've been trying to use surface albedo as a proxy for mass balance uh, with uh, a number of methods. Uh, first, in our uh, expeditions to Denali, we uh, measured spectral snow and ice albedo 
Uh, and using that, we uh, validate satellite based albedo records. And then we're trying to relate that to mass balance, regional climatology, and the records from the Denali Ice Core. So, our field site is the Great uh, Denali National Park in the Central Alaska Range. Um, to point out a couple of things, we have uh, not a formally Denali peak, uh, which used to be Mount McKinley, uh, and then Kit Hilton Base Camp, Mount Hunter, and uh, Kit Hilton Glacier. This is the largest glacier in the Central Alaska Range. Uh, it's been measured 71 kilometers in length and about 3,600 meters in relief. Uh, so it's quite uh, a large glacier for this area uh, and for Alaska. Uh, this is Liz Burakowski. Uh, at the time, she was a PhD candidate at UNH uh, and had access to this uh, wonderful instrument, the uh, Field Spec 4 spectroradiometer. Uh, it measures reflectance across the shortwave spectrum with a narrow bandwidth. Its hyperspectral resolution is about 10 <coughs> nanometers, uh, and that comes into play later. Uh, so in the field on seven uh, super clear days, like to, uh, this one, for example, we measured optical grain size and snow pits, uh, incoming solar radiation, and outgoing uh, reflectance. Uh, and here's the, that data uh, for the seven days uh, in our first field campaign. Um, over a number, number of weeks. Uh, spectral albedo is albedo across the spectrum. Uh, and you can see there's a evident uh, decrease in albedo uh, as time progressed. Uh, so this is the aging of snow. It could be uh, just as we enter the warming uh, season summer. Uh, one uh, line to note though is this red line. Uh, it's the third sampling day, uh, but it is appears above the, the green line. There was a snow event the day before. Um, so that increased, or that, that fresh snow powder with a higher albedo, uh, the fresh snow has a higher albedo, and we can see that from uh, our measurements in the field. So this is a, a simplified work workflow. <coughs> uh, we have this in situ data, the high spectral data, um, and to compare apples to apples, uh, you need apples to begin with. Uh, so we had to transform that app, that hyperspectral data um, to shortwave broadband albedo so we could compare it to our MODIS data, our satellite data. Uh, and we used this uh, radio transfer model, the SMART 295 model, um, which looks at uh, a number of parameters, aerosol, aerosol optical depth, um, days, uh, location, a number of things. Um, and we used that, we incorporated that radio transfer model into uh, the hyperspectral data uh, to get uh, a single value, the broadband albedo, over the shortwave broadband, shortwave uh, waves. Uh, and then we could compare it to our MODIS data. So our MODIS data, we use the MODIS albedo product, the Short term is MCD 43A3. Um, it's a 16 day composite, uh, so 16 days into one product, uh, level three data, and graded at 500 meter resolution. Uh, there's a, the current version is version six. It's, uh, it uses daily products, uh, uses daily data retrievals and pr provides daily products. Version five is um, a 16 day composite still, uh, but it uses eight day retrievals. Uh, and so it's not as, uh, it is more coarse. Uh, and then uh, we had our two sites, this is base camp. Uh, and then we had a number of transects, transects out on the Kahilman Glacier. So to, to begin, this is uh, some of the data. We have um, the albedo on the X, uh, the satellite derived albedo on the x-axis and the in-situ uh, hyperspectral data on the y. Um, and it appears that there's really strong correlation, R square values of uh, greater than 0.99. Um, and this would say that uh, what we see in the satellites uh, correctly uh, models what we see uh, and measure in the field. 
However, if we, if we zoom in a little bit uh, and compare apples to apples again, um, we don't have quite as strong um, correlations. Um, so go back one minute. These are white sky and blue sky. Black sky is uh, the direct component. White sky is diffuse component of uh, optics. Uh, when we we can combine them and get blue sky, which is uh, near real time and what we measure in the field. Um, we see a strong uh, relationship and the satellite perform well uh, at base camp. However, it uh, doesn't do so well out in the glacier. Uh, there's uh, a, low, a low bias um, with the, the newest version of MODIS. Um, and we get a value of 0.64. That's a really low albedo for a glacier. Uh, you could think of this uh, maybe as melt ponds or crevasses. We think it uh, was interference from the snow, uh, snow free valley, uh, less than 800 meters away. Um, up in the Arctic, the satellites, uh, it's graded as 500 meter data, uh, but it's, uh, it could be elongated and uh, incorporate part of that snow free wall. Um, so we think it's we think it's that. Uh, we're looking at other possibilities, uh, and we're also looking at uh, including Landsat data to uh, maybe zoom in a little bit more. It has better spatial resolution, um, and uh, it could strengthen our MODIS validation uh, and validate our base camp models more or better. Um, and then we could produce that long-term satellite record compared to the ice core, uh, to uh, volcanics and biomass records, uh, and then the glacier mass balance data. This is from the National Park Service. They have uh, a fairly long term, back to the ni early 90s, of uh, mass balance. The blue line is uh, the Hil Cahillon Glacier. And uh, there's not much of a trend here, uh, but we will see if uh, our, our albedo record tells a different story. <laughs> And with that, uh, I'd like to thank all the <coughs> folks, uh, my committee members, uh, folks out in the field, our funding sources, CCI. And uh, I'll leave you with this picture of our drill site up on Mount Hunter, uh, around 13,000 feet. And we'd be happy to take any questions. Could you go back two slides? And uh, I didn't have time to absorb that. Uh, yeah, what is the elevation? So it's equilibrium. Oh, that's equilibrium line altitude. Okay. So there hasn't been increase in elevation of the field today. Too dry. Uh, up till at least 2010. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the speakers for very interesting, diverse, and well-timed presentations. We have a short break. We'll reconvene in about 10 minutes at 2.15, so you'll have to go practice speed eating if you want to snack.